Okay. So we're going to start with 4.9 number 4. And for this function, we're given f of x is equal to 1 fifth minus 3 divided by x. Um, how might you think about going that? So one thing that you might want to do is to rewrite this function as 1 fifth minus 3 times x to the negative 1. And then if you were to use power rule on this to find the antiderivative, I'm going to call my antiderivative g of x, we see that 1 fifth is going to have to be 1 fifth x. And then thinking about power rule, what do we typically do to power rule? We would add 1 to the numerator and then divide by that. And in this case, that would be adding 1 to get 0. We would get x to the 0, 3 divided by 0, which is bad. The reason why I write all this out is because this is the error that you'll make every single time for that I'll make. This is weird because I right. feel like I'm talking on a video instead <laughs> of talking to a person. But that's cool. Um, yeah, so that's not how it works. Instead, we have to use our trick. And what's our trick is that we can use the fact that 1 over x the derivative of natural log is 1 over x. So the antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. And do they give us a point? No, nope, there's no point that we need, so that's it. That's a good problem. It's a good review of the fact that, and I'll write that down below here, that if h of x is equal to the natural log of x, then h prime of x is going to be equal to 1 over x. So that means that if I'm taking the antiderivative, any time I have x to the negative 1, I go backwards using natural log. Cool. Next problem is, I guess, that I want to talk about is 4.9 number 8. So this looks like some of the other problems, but it's actually a little unconventional. Um, so for this one, we're given what the second derivative is. The second derivative is 4 plus cosine x. And then we're going to given some initial values. We're given that f of 0 is equal to negative 1. And we're also given that f of, or at least in my copy, I have 3 pi over 2 is equal to 0. Notice it doesn't give you any initial values for your first derivative. But that's OK. It turns out that we'll be able to solve for our constants anyway. So. Let's take one antiderivative. So my first antiderivative, 4 becomes 4x, and cosine of x becomes, I have to think, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So I don't want negative sine. I want to go as an antiderivative. It becomes positive sine. Sine of x plus some constant. So now ta let's take the second derivative again. And I get f of x is equal to the 4x. I can use power rule and get 2x squared plus going backwards in time. The derivative of sine is cosine. So the antiderivative of sine is going to be negative cosine. Plus this constant now, notice it's like a number like 4. So I have to make sure that I use a polynomial rule. This becomes c times x plus d, because I can have some new constant because I took another antiderivative. And this is where I can use my cool information. These two pieces will solve for what c and d needs to be. So let's plug in the easy one. We know that f of 0 is equal to 1. And so I'm going to plug 0 into this function, and I get 0 minus the cosine of 0 plus 0 plus d is all equal to 1. Let's simplify this one more step. So that means that 1 is equal to cosine of 0 is 1. So I have negative 1 plus d. I'm going to add these, and I get that d equals 2. Let's use that information to solve for what c needs to be using all of this stuff. So now we also know that maybe I'll write this out so that it's a little more clear. We found what d is. Let's add this in. I'm just rewriting my function. 2x squared minus 
cosine x plus cx plus d, which is 2. And I'm going to plug in the values that I get. I know that when x is equal to 3 pi over 2, I get 2, 3 pi over 2 squared minus the cosine of 3 pi over 2 plus c times 3 pi over 2 plus 2 all has to be equal to 0. And this is a little bit messy, but we can simplify it a little bit. We're going to get c all by itself. What's the cosine of 3 pi over 2? I'm going to draw a quick unit circle to remind myself. Here's 1 pi over 2, here's 2 pi over 2, here's 3 pi over 2. So that means the cosine of this is the x-coordinate, which is 0, which is a little convenient. Um, I guess maybe I should do this part first. This is going to be 2 times 9 pi over 4 minus 0 plus... What was that? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Nice. There we go. Plus c times 3 pi over 2 plus 2. That's all equal to 0. So the 2 cancels one of the 2's in the denominator here. And I'm going to subtract both of these chunks to the other side. So this becomes negative 9 pi over 2. This becomes negative 2 is equal to c times 3 pi over 2. And now I'm going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal. So this is times 2 over 3 pi times 2 over 3 pi. And look, there's my answer for c. If you had a calculator, then you could plug it in and it would tell you that c was exactly equal to 2 divided by 3 pi times negative 9 pi over 2 minus 2. That looks sort of horrible. I don't know. And that's just specific to this problem. If right. you had different constants, you'd have different numbers yeah. anyway. Yeah. Cool. But the tricky part of this one is that typically as you were going along, you could solve for one constant at a time. Yeah. And in this one, you had to take both of the derivatives and that you'll have one of them as a linear term and the other one's just a constant. All right, let's talk about number 12. I need to pull up number 12. So this is 4.9, number 12. What do we have? We know what the derivative is equal to. F prime, ah, yes. Yeah, this is an intentionally tricky one. Much like the natural log one. I'm glad that you brought this up. So again, maybe I could do this in a thought bubble. The first thought when I see something like this is, aha, maybe I want to rewrite this. I could re rewrite this as 8 times 1 plus t squared to the negative 1. This is just a different way to be able to write this derivative. So now when I take the antiderivative, I have to be... It, I can't distribute this negative 1 power. That's not how negative 1 powers work. So it sort of looks like you might want to use chain rule. But we don't have a chain rule yet for antiderivatives. So it means that this is not really a helpful way of thinking about the problem using rules of polynomials. Instead, you have to remember, think back to the archives way back, that we have said that um, if I have an inverse trig function, tang inverse of t, the derivative of the inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus t squared. So this is one of several of these crazy ones, and these actually end up being important. We're going to do a whole section on inverse trig um, antiderivatives. I guess we'll call them integrals when we do them. So this is one that I do want you to remember. Um, and that means that when I look back at this original problem, uh, it's better for me to think of it as 8 times 1 over 1 plus t squared, because now I know, aha, when I take the antiderivative, f of t is just going to be 8 times 
the inverse tangent of t. And I can check this by going backwards, and this coefficient is just going to stay. The 8 just stays. I don't need to worry about doing some sort of prob product rule because it's not a product of two functions of t. It's just a product of something, and something else. Cool. But now let's plug in our values. And this is something you could just plug this into a calculator. Oh, plus c. So if this whole thing needs to be equal, I guess in mine it's equal to 0. Um, then 0 would be equal to 8 times the inverse tangent of 1 plus c. So negative 8 inverse tangent of 1 is equal to c. Because I just subtracted this from this side. And I need to look at my unit circle again. I don't expect you to memorize this. This is something you could pluck it into your calculator as long as you have your calculator in radians. The inverse tangent of 1 is going to be the angle where sines and cosines are exactly equal to one another. So it's going to be the angle of pi over 4. I don't know if that picture is helpful or it's something that you could plug in, but that means yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are only a few inverse tang things yeah. that I would have memorized, and this is one of, <laughs> one of two of them, really. Um, but it gives us a nice solution. And then c in this case is going to be negative 2 pi is equal to c. Am I still on the screen? Yeah. Cool. And I can put that into my original function. Cool. I think that those are all of the problems that I want to write out by hand, unless there are other things that we should talk about. I do want to talk about 5.1 number 4, but that's something that I want to do on. Okay. Joe